set up. So let's see. Oh, that does work. It sure does. Uh, let's start in prayer all together. Um, so I invite you to, to join us in uh, saying this prayer. The Lord be with you. Creator God, we thank you that by water and the Holy Spirit, you have bestowed upon us, your servants, forgiveness of sin, and raised us to new life and peace. Sustain us in the Lord. Give us the inquiring and discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, of spirit to know you and to love you, and the gift and joy and wonder in all your works. Amen. Before we do get started, um, we wanted to kind of give you an overview of what our focus and purpose will be this afternoon so you kind of have um, understanding of what our expectations of what we, we hope to cover. Um, and you've got some handouts. I know lots of folks are always interested in what are resources for confirmation, um, whether it's for youth or adults. So we're really not going to be focusing on that today, but your handout has all of that um, information on it. Uh, what we are going to be doing, and, and we're really going to be focusing on young people, uh, mostly because that is what um, some of the research that we're basing our collaborative on is focused on. Um, but certainly, I think there's lots of, of learnings from the research about young people and confirmation that could apply to adults in many, many respects. Um, so we do value adult formation and confirmation, but we're really, our conversation is going to mostly focus on youth. Um, what our, our focus also is going to be on is reorienting the Episcopal Church as to what confirmation is and how it is a reaffirmation of baptism. That will be a lot of our, our focus. And some of this we're hoping to be inspirational, but grounded, informative, but open to conversation. And a lot of that is we don't want to get lost in the weeds in some of this and really look at an overarching um, theological perspective and how we can do confirmation well in the Episcopal Church. Because we've learned that confirmation not done well can be harmful and can be detrimental. And perhaps if confirmation cannot be done well, this will be a little provocative. Maybe we shouldn't be doing confirmation for that. So we're going to introduce ourselves. Um, and we're going to just let my colleagues kind of jump in um, to decide we won't go in row, however you want to, to um, do this. And so we're going to tell you who we are, what our context is, because we really understand that confirmation ministry um, and as in all formation, context is really important. And we'll, we may share a story about what we why we are called to this work, why we care about confirmation, and um, including maybe a personal story of that. So we're briefly going to introduce ourselves for that. Whoever wants to go first? Hello, I am uh, Patrick Hongriga. Uh My context is that currently I'm serving as the lay um, associate for youth ministries at Trinity Episcopal Church in Menlo Park, California, uh, Diocese of California. Um, this month I just started uh, year four there, so that's exciting. Uh, previous to that, um, uh, I was serving uh, in various uh, ministry capacities in New York, uh, primarily on uh, assisting with youth and young adult ministry in the Diocese of Long Island, uh, serving uh, children and youth in a parish part-time in New Jersey, um, and then really my start in ministry was uh, through two years of service in the Episcopal Service Corps in Baltimore and, and Boston. Um, and so that's kind of my history. And originally I'm from Arkansas. And my story of uh, uh, confirmation and that I think influences much of my thinking about confirmation is, um, you know, around 18 or 19, just after high school, um, I did my own deep discernment about uh, the whole God question. I had grown up not going to church, but in a very church community. 
um, and the question of God seemed uh, immense, uh, and so much so that um, I couldn't leave it unaddressed. Um, and so I wrestled with that, and uh, surprised to me, uh, discerned that I believed in God, and then um, explored kind of the various Christian traditions that were available to me in the, the city I was living in at the time. Um, I did not necessarily think um, the Episcopal Church was going to be where I was going to land, but I did. Um, and within like the first year, I was able to do, I was invited to mentor a confirmation class with uh, youth, and I didn't feel adequate, but the rector called me into it. Uh, and by the end of it, I found that my own faith was informed by the young people I was supposed to be mentoring, and I asked to be confirmed with them. Mm. And so, uh, yeah. Um, and I value very much the discernment that's involved in confirmation. Thanks, Patrick. Jen. Um, I don't know how many folks in the room are old enough to remember the vice presidential candidate that opened debate by saying, who am I, why am I here? Um, throughout this conference, and especially in the, our last seminar, I started thinking, what am I doing here? I don't, you know, there's so many people who are so much more qualified than me. And then I realized that I'm here because God called me to be here. And I'm here because um, I'm part of this awesome formation group in this awesome church that lifts up lay leaders. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, so my name is Jen Enriquez, and I am the director of children's and youth formation at St. Christopher's in Oak Park, Illinois. Um, we are just outside of Chicago. Um, confirmation is important to me because um, I, I was the, the children's minister first and then took on the youth program. And I'm now, we haven't had confirmation in a couple of years. The prior model was to um, basically get to the point where the kids went on pilgrimage and then they were confirmed and then they were done. And the last time that happened was right before I started and none of the pilgrims wanted to be confirmed. And that's okay to choose not to be confirmed, but I don't, there was no real discernment process that I witnessed. And um, I also have a personal belief that formation in general, as we do it as Christians, or as Protestants, I'll say, um, needs a little bit of a revolution. The, the model that we're kind of currently using, or many people are currently using, is the Sunday school confirmation track from the 1950s. And I've learned that um, the baby boomers who were part of that are some of the most unchurched people we have. So clearly, it, it didn't work that well. And I think there's so much opportunity, rich opportunity, for all of us to work together and um, do something better. And so I'm really grateful to be a part of this process. Um, thank you to Lisa and Sharon for inviting me into it. Um, and that's me. Hi, everybody. It's that time in the afternoon. If you get sleepy, get up, move, stretch. <laughs> this is a weird, dark room. Uh, I'm Lisa Kimball. I, my day job is at Virginia Seminary, where I'm a member of the faculty, and I serve as the Associate Dean of Lifelong Learning. Why I think I'm here talking about confirmation is God's great sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> my confirmation experience was as bad as it comes. I was a little girl in London, England. We lived in North London. And I was about that age that you're supposed to go to confirmation, and I went, and my whole experience was six dark nights in the side chapel of a very old, cold English church in the winter. And what I remember most, I don't remember anything about the old vicar leaning on a, on a podium, talking to us, lecturing. What I remember was the night, the last night of the sessions, where he came out from behind it for the first time, and he looked at us and he said, whom among you wants to be confirmed? And everybody, all my little friends, put their hands up and I didn't. And then he just said that again and again and again until I started to raise my hand. <laughs> um, and all I knew, I was probably 12, and all I knew was that I'd been kind of threatened into something that I didn't understand and that I didn't feel ready for. 
And I walked out of the dark church that night through the nave that was really dark. Uh, and I had, as I came out of the church, the closest thing I've ever had to an experience of God um, that I cannot explain. It was a pitch dark gravel parking lot and there was a bright light that I have, that was not a light bulb, it was not a street light, um, that nobody else saw, because I asked my friends. And what I knew in the middle of seeing that light was God somehow telling me in some kind of way that I understood that I was loved. And I took that as a way to go home in the dark and talk to my parents about this thing that was gonna happen. Fast forward, Bishop comes, we're in little white dresses, all the girls on one side, all the boys on the other side. All I remember about that liturgy was we got the giggles, the pew, ee, 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 ee. and going up and trying to stifle my giggles before I kneeled, knelt before the bishop. And the whole thing I remember was counting the laces on his shoes so that I wouldn't smirk while he put his hands on my head. So. None of that worked the way it was supposed to, but God was there somehow. Fast, fast, fast forward, I was invited to be part of the Confirmation Project research team that we'll hear more about. And this God sense of humor thing is God sort of saying, okay, now you've got to think about what confirmation really means and why does it matter? And I've come out the other side of that research really passionate about why confirmation matters. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I, I'm a baby boomer. Um, so I am one of those that, for me, confirmation, I was 12 years old also, um, and we were using the 1928 Book of Common Prayer, so my carrot for being confirmed with a whole bunch of other kids, because the churches were overflowing with, with children, uh, at the time was that I could receive communion after I was confirmed. That was the difference. Um, but the main thing is, you know, in that group of 25 or 30, 12 year olds, me and one other boy were the only ones that came back to church afterwards. I had to memorize the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and my bounden duty. I sort of remember something about the catechism in the prayer book. Maybe that's what we used as a curriculum. I don't remember any of that. I remember having to go into the rector's office by myself with the door closed and recite all of those things back to him. So, and, and hanging out with all my friends um, as we crammed to go over it, testing each other over and over, and then, okay, you're done, you can go, yes, you can be confirmed, next, next one. I don't remember anything relational about it at all. I do remember that priest because um, he was there for a really long time, and his secretary was the other person who were with, was with us, and I never quite understood that, that whole thing. Um, the other part, um, where I am in, and confirmation has sort of just always been with me in many ways, especially becoming a parent um, and remaining in the church and raising my children who are now adults in the church and my daughter wanting to be confirmed I um, mean, having be, been the, one of the leaders of that confirmation, having your child in the program, I do not recommend doing that. Um, but she really wanted to be confirmed, and, but she had a whole cadre of, and she was 14, I think, um, that had grown up with her in the church. So it really was a peer group community thing for them. And she remained very active, as did most of those other young people at that time, was confirmed. Um, my son, who's three years younger than her, um, it was 15 when they were offering confirmation at that time, and he said, no, I don't want to participate. And I was not leading confirmation at that time. He said, no, I do not want to be confirmed. I do not want to participate in any of that. I know what they're going to teach us. I already know those answers, because he was dragged to church all the time. I was working there. Um, and he says, I know I'm never going to see those people again. I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. I know that um, I, can, I am a member of this church, I can receive communion, that's all I need. Um, and I said, well, I guess that's okay, you articulated that enough for me. And my stance was, well, as a parent, um, when you were baptized, I made a promise that you would at some, some point be confirmed. And 
Only a couple years later have I learned that that was from the 28 prayer book that I had learned that, that there's nothing that a parent promises in baptism today. I mean, that they will see their child, you know, grow in a life of faith and things. There was nothing I had ever promised when my children were baptized because they, they could receive communion the minute they put their hand out, and that's when they did as children. And so since then, I've always, and I, right now, this is my first year of being a confirmation um, leader in my parish with a whole bunch of kids, some who are very active and no Bible, no worship, and then there are others who came and said, who's Adam? What is sin? What are we talking about here? So, and that brings us all together, and I'm sure all of you have conversations and stories to tell too. So we think it's important for to take a few moments for you to talk with someone near you that you may not know, um, so a friendly stranger, just for a few minutes, um, and talk about, introduce yourself, where you're from, um, and we'll do this really quickly, so like two minutes a piece, uh, three minutes a piece, um, and share a story, whether it's about confirmation, maybe you have not been confirmed also, or your baptism, maybe you have not been to baptize either, or what are you seeking? So one of those things, just have a brief conversation, um, take turns with one another in, um, in sharing that, and then we'll re rejoin each other. And maybe when we do get <laughs> to questions and stuff.
this right the website. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't, like, it's too far back. It's weird, yeah. I think I'm going to end up streaking out, frankly, but... Hopefully you've all had a little time to share a story or two and get to know one another better. Um, this is a practice I also like to do when I'm talking to adults about and parents about what confirmation is. And oftentimes when they share their story, if they have or haven't been confirmed, there's some suddenly ahas in that and then thinking about why they're asking or wanting their child to be confirmed when they realize they may have some good experiences or bad experiences themselves and how that informs how we move forward for that. One of the things we thought would be really important in all of us in talking to others about confirmation uh, is there are lots of myths about what's going on in, you know, that the church, the Episcopal church um, has floats around and, and there are facts for that too. So we want to, you know, kind of share what some of those are um, and name the inconsistencies that, that are encountered. For example, there are lots of dioceses that have guidelines for confirmation that might state an age or a length of period of time for preparation or any those those sorts of things. And they're all different from diocese to diocese. And some dioceses don't have those things. But some of the things that we've discovered is even though dioceses have these guidelines, most of the time they're not enforced. And people don't know they exist. And some are doing them and some aren't doing them. And so none of them are standard for the Episcopal Church. It's sort of a local kind of context. And coming from the Diocese of Connecticut and helping write some guidelines 12, 15 years ago, they still are on the website somewhere, but there's most people don't even know they exist um, kind of thing because there's always a change in, in leadership. Another myth is that confirmation is the completion of baptism. And that perhaps comes from the past in history and that confirmation didn't exist um, in the early church for sure. It was baptism. That was the rite of initiation, and that was full membership in the church. And that's what it is today. There are lots in my home parish, lots of our young people, when we say, why do you want to be confirmed? They'll say, well, I want to be an adult. 
And he says, well, confirmation's not going to make you an adult. Or they'll say, I want everyone to think of me as an adult in the community. Um, in some cases, that does happen. But in most cases, it doesn't, because we still continue to treat them as young people and not adults in that. Um, right. Another um, place is that you can't receive communion. Yes, you can. I don't, I don't think that's so much around anymore now, but there is still some parents, especially, who um, sort of, especially if children are small, will put their hand out and don't really want their child to receive communion or are waiting for first communion before there's conf or confirmation before they receive communion. That's not part of the Episcopal Church's practice. Um, that's the truth. Um, and that in order to be confirmed, one must memorize the catechism or know certain things. And we know that in the Episcopal Church, the prayer book basically says that when someone is of mature age, that's up for interpretation, is duly prepared, that's up for interpretation, will come before a bishop for the laying on of hands. And that's the part that I think everybody sort of focuses on. Yes, the bishop is coming. We need to have some people prepared so that they can have their hands laid on them for that. Um, there's another um, myth regarding the canons in confirmation. And hope, yes, and I brought them with me. Thank you to Lisa for discovering the exact part of what the canons say. Because there are some in the House of Bishops who would say that one must be 16 years old. There is nothing of age stated in the canons about when one should be um, confirmed. The canons, Canon 17, Section 1 says, all persons who have received the sacrament of holy baptism with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, whether in this church or in another Christian church, in whose baptisms have been duly recorded in this church, are members thereof. But then there's another one about adult members, which is, that was A, and this is B. It says, members 16 years of age and over are to be considered adult members. Confirmation is not mentioned in that line at all. However, in Clause C, it says, this is where I think folks have tried to um, help move things along and what their theology of confirmation is, is blended A, B, and C all together. And that C says, it is expected that all adult members of this church, after appropriate instruction, will have made a mature public affirmation of their faith and commitment to the responsibilities of their baptism and will have been confirmed or received by the laying on of hands by a bishop of this church or by a bishop of a church in full communion with this church, like the ELCA, as an example. And then there were others, other, other parts of this. General Convention has had lots of conversation about what um, one needs to do to hold office in the Episcopal Church and full membership in all of that. But it really comes down to baptism and not confirmation for all of those things. Although there are little things that say about holding office and vestry members that are, some would say, are tied to confirmation for that. So those are the major myths um, about that. Are there others that? Yes, other myths? other myths that you have heard. And that, yes, confirmation is graduation. Um, and that's because we are not a church necessarily that looks at lifelong Christian formation. So why do young people leave after they've been confirmed? Because there's nothing for them. There's no way to fully embrace them into the life of the congregation um, or continue their formation. Um, our adults engaged in formation, and how then do we um, engage young people in that too? So I've, I've also heard that kind of notion, that's a description, right, of what a lot of people have experienced or almost expect, and if we expect it, people will leave. But I've also heard it lightly veiled 
with a rationalization that says, well, they're going to leave after confirmation because that's what young adults do. This is, and then I've heard neuroscience brought in. Well, that's what their brain, their brains are just developing. And so, you know, they're learning to think independently. And therefore, you know, it's normal that they would take a leave and they would go away until they're ready to come back. So we softened the reality that we're doing something poorly when they disappear by sort of saying, yes, it's totally normal. They're, they're, we hear, I hear people who are lightly trained in psychology saying, well, it's, this is when they're individuating. This is when they're developing their identities. Yeah, it is. Wouldn't it be lovely if they were doing that in the context of a loving Christian community that affirmed who they are and invited them to go deeper in their relationship with God through Jesus Christ? That can happen too. But this idea that, oh, they're 16, they're independent. The other one that gets tied to that is, well, they're busy. They're driving. They can't get here. But that's why we don't see them. There's something else that's there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Confirmation is our version of a bat mitzvah or a bar mitzvah. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. And do you, is there more to that, or the idea that it's a right of tra it's a transition? It's like an initiation right into adulthood. Yeah, so like my kids have Jewish friends. That's how they explain it mm -hmm. to each other. Yeah. So there's also that misunderstanding by those who are preparing for confirmation. Exactly. What are they preparing for? I mean a bar and bat mitzvah, that really is a, a for adulthood kind of thing in the, in the Jewish community, while um, really confirmation is a reclaiming or a reaffirmation of one's baptism for that. Thanks. I'm going to move on and talk about the actual confirmation project, which is sort of what spearheaded all of us getting together to talk. So I mentioned earlier in my introduction that I, was, I received an invitation to join a Lilly Endowment funded five-year project called the Confirmation Project. And what it was was, you may know, how many of you are aware of that work? A good number of you, okay, thank you. Um, it was five mainline denominations, or once mainline, or however you want to define them, five Protestant denominations that practice infant baptism and confirmation or equivalent practices with teenagers. So it was the Episcopal Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, the, the Presbyterian Church USA, African Methodist Episcopal, and United Methodist. <clears throat> and, and basically a, an academic from each tradition and a research assistant from each tradition were the core team for this project. And it was headed out of Princeton University. The primary research question is what is what are the current confirmation practices across our traditions? And how are they impacting youth discipleship? It was a mixed method study. So it would, that means in social scientific language, it was part um, what's called kind of uh, positivistic data, is survey-based data, quantitative data that can be analyzed with um, statistics. And it was part qualitative data, which means we ask open-ended questions, we learn about how people understand the meaning of something. The survey part, some of you may have participated in, it was sent to congregations in all five denominations, leaders who were involved in confirmation leadership in congregations, parents of young people who were currently or recently in confirmation, and as many young people as we could reach in confirmation programs. It was a long survey. It was designed to mirror a European survey so that the data that we collected could accurately be compared to European practices in Western Europe. There are lots of disadvantages of long surveys. Um, the access to people was actually very difficult. All of our denominations do not maintain central email addresses. Some of them we had to do, had to reach people in very different ways. So it became a representative sample of all of our denominations. But nonetheless, we ended up with a database that was, if you care about statistics, reliable, valid, and really legitimate in terms of the research that we got from that side of our gathering. Thousands of surveys were completed across many congregations. On the qualitative side, we visited 17 congregations and six camps across our five denominations. And we sent survey research teams into these places. We, by design, came up with congregations that were very diverse, 
rural, urban, small, large, conservative theologically, more progressive theologically. Congregations that had really robust confirmation programs and confirmations that were doing something well, but you wouldn't look at it and say, whoa. Uh, and we used something called portraiture, which was a model of listening. It's a form of ethnography to go in and watch and listen and interview and observe and then write up a story about what we experienced that the congregation then affirmed because they said, yeah, that's what we're doing. And it's meant to describe in a rich way what we saw and what we learned. All of that information was then put together for us to come back as a research team and think through what did we learn about confirmation. Oops, do you want me to go further? Sure. Um, so, <laughs> some of the sort of high level learnings, um, she has here on the slide, and it's from one of our infographics, that youth confirmation matters. That's true, but it's not true. One of the things we learned was that a really good confirmation program by itself does not move the needle of the believing, behaving, and belonging dimensions of young people and church. A confirmation program that is connected to a fabric of Christian formation that is continuous from childhood into adulthood in a congregation that cares about its young people does move the needle of belief and belonging. So thinking of confirmation as just a program or just a service when the bishop shows up and does his or her magic thing does not allow people to understand the transformative nature of what confirmation can be. So isolated confirmation does not transform the lives of young people or sustain a more mature life in Christ. We know that good confirmation in all of our denominations happens, the ministry of confirmation happens because there's a cheerleader. There's somebody who believes in it and leads it well and invites other people into the leadership and the processes that are confirmation. Maybe the clergy person, in many cases it was a lay person. We know that young people who were interviewed and visited and observed, they want a program that talks about real things. They don't just want pizza and games. They want a program that will talk about God and Jesus and sin and doubt and the Bible. They want it to be real in their lives and real in our tradition. They don't want church light, L-I-T-E. They want church that matters. They want adults in conversation with them who make a difference. We know that it has to happen in community. We'll say more about that. I'll, we'll say more about the ecology. This is that continuous climate. Um, what we know <clears throat> is that, as Sharon said so well, confirmation ministries in all of these congregations we surveyed and we visited had everything from kids who were made to be there and had really barely been in church to kids who were like total church geeks, like some of us maybe were, who couldn't get enough of it, to somebody in the middle. And so you had to be prepared to teach the basics and receive the mature. And that's not easy to do, which means it's not about a single curriculum that works for everybody. Everything is contextual. We have to adapt this idea of what will it look like to reaffirm baptismal vows right where we are. Who are these particular young people in front of us what are their particular stories? And how do we listen so deeply behind what they're telling us to figure out what their deep questions are? And then that's the local flavor. Um, this last piece, number eight, where it says Christian Foundation for Public Life, I tie that to young people saying it's gotta be relevant. The so what? Like this needs to matter when I go to school. This needs to matter when I'm dating. This needs to matter at my job. This stuff we're talking about at church can't be just this church silo that's really nice and pious, and then I go out there and I deal with evil in the world that doesn't make sense. I need to be able to understand why my baptism empowers me, gives me superpowers to go out there and challenge the evil that I see or that I experience. Kids want to be heroes. They want us to equip them, and our tradition can do that, but we have to be willing to talk about darkness and evil and what it looks like to be part of systemic oppression and to contribute to that. So kids want real, they want adults who take them seriously, and confirmation developmentally is, we found, 
a really opportune time to come alongside young people who are asking questions of identity, who are asking questions of belonging, who are asking existential questions about the meaning of life, and to say, yeah, we have some answers. Not easy answers, answers will work out together, but they're grounded in the death resurre and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. So what does this have to do with the Episcopal Church? Where did we fit in in some of the specific studies? And um, on, on your, your handout and also earlier, there was you saw the, the website for the Confirmation Project. There's lots of information there. And before I forget, also um, a book that is um, on the list is Cultivating Teen Faith, which uh, the insights from the Confirmation Project, which is published by Erdman's. Um, this has a lot of the data and information in it, if, if you're into that um, in stuff for helping, because it's also helping in the conversation about why we need, need to move that needle that, that Lisa mentions. In the Episcopal Church, what was discovered is that we are all over the board. Um, while some de denominations, there are some specifics. For example, on this particular chart up here talks about um, duration of preparation. And in the Episcopal Church, it is all over the map. Some places it's meet with a rector one time, three months, two years. Age is very different. It could be 12-year-olds or 18-year-olds or adults only. So we are, and it, that is in the diocese or for community to community also. So there isn't this unified thought. For example, the uh, ELCA is very robust and m much more uniform with longer length of time, older uh, candidates for confirmation. The camps that we visited were predominantly ELCA camps, a few that were ecumenical, because ELCA have a one to two year standard for confirmation preparation, and they have begun to have confirmation camps. And there are a few places where the Episcopal Church participates in those. But that's, they, they are the gold standard in many ways. Just because they're long and enduring does not mean that lives were being changed, however. Mm -hmm. no. Anything else you guys want to add to that? If you're wondering where the AME are in this chart, the reason they aren't here is that's a denomination that does not have a centralized database. So we did not have enough data collected by surveys to be able to accurately represent some of their patterns. Um, they are a denomination that does baptize infants, and they have other rites that are similar to confirmation in adolescence. Some AME churches do celebrate confirmation, um, but so we have a lot of qualitative data from AME traditions, AME congregations, uh, but, they were, but we were careful not to statistically misuse the data that we had. Another uh, finding was that Many uh, other denominations spend a lot more time and resources on adult formation, uh, which the Episcopal Church is not known to do that. And so there is a place for, for those who are confirmed to continue their uh, formation um, and education and learning and growing in faith, while the Episcopal Church does not have that structure in most parishes. So that's an opportunity. Um, and looking at the, the research and the findings from that to say in our congregations, guess what? Here's some research that shows where we have uh, room to grow, and here's a cutting edge that we can sort of start building upon. Um, the other part is that um, to really say that this is an opportunity, it, it has been shown that confirmation, if done well, can lead to a place for adults who walk with our young people as well as our young people to grow in a deeper relationship with Christ and in themselves and find who they are and, and understand that. Um, earlier I was in the panel, I listened to the panel that Dwight Shiley and those groups are talking about change in the church. And one thing they kept saying was, how are we helping our congregations reclaim Jesus and reclaim our focus on God and not necessarily on ourselves, but how we're being able to articulate our own story out in the world? And I kept thinking, yeah, that's what we should be doing in our preparation. Um, 
with young people for confirmation um, for that. How are we building on building relationships? How are we expanding that to the few people who may be walking alongside young people um, in confirmation and not broadening that to the whole faith community um, as part of that and not separating um, all of this? So there were four key learnings that came out of the study, and um, they were on design, leadership, ecology, and curriculum. So each of us, I mean, we were going to share some stories of how that is lived out. Um, so why don't we start with um, the design part, which is, you know, everyone wants to know what curriculum to use and stuff like that. But that's not necessarily the answer, because it's all different context. So. Um, Who's going to do that? Patrick was. Patrick's going to talk about design for that. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so design um, speaks to um, the points that Lisa made about uh, confirmation being real and relevant, uh, that it has local flavor. Um, and um, uh, in, in my context, uh, that it, it, it relates to public life in the way that uh, we live this faith life out in the world. Um, and so in my context at Trinity, uh, in uh, the past three years, I've found myself very immersed in this um, deep discernment about uh, what is it that my young people really desire and trying to deeply listen. Um, uh, and that's just conversations, that's even uh, kind of things like surveys and like all sorts of things of really just trying to hear what I can hear from them. Um, and, um, and then also doing the, the deep discernment in myself about um, what is the vision that I'm casting for the ministry uh, that I'm blessed to be a part of and how am I uh, adequately and more than adequately meeting the desires and hopes of my young people, um, uh, especially as it uh, relates to them being able to uh, fully live into whatever God is calling them to. Um, and so I, um, this time last year, I was at um, uh, the Forma Conference, which is uh, joined in with this Rooted in Jesus Conference. So Forma being a collegial group of people who do Christian education uh, with all um, ages. Um, I did um, a training that also was repeated uh, this year in a pre-conference, which was um, dismantling racism, uh, particularly with youth. Maybe some of you did that. Um, uh, it's also uh, uh, particularly um, wonderful to talk about because it originated here in the Diocese of Atlanta. Um, and um, uh, I sat in that training and had conversations about race and particularly how you might have those conversations with youth. And I got really jazzed and I was like, this seems like something I would really like to explore, seems like something I would like to do with my young people. Um, and off in the corner of my mind, uh, I had the idea of like, oh, I wonder what this would look like in the context of confirmation. Um, but then I kind of filed it away as one of my more wilder ideas. Um, and let it sit. Um, and fortunately, months later, um, in my context at Trinity, um, uh, I'm allowed and I advocate for, I, I take kind of a work week and I retreat. And what I do on my retreat is um, I take all my kind of crazier ideas and I take um, a lot of um, kind of the stuff like surveys and different uh, information gathering I've done with my young people. Um, and I really just sit with it and listen and, um, and, and try to hear where God is guiding us. Um, and so, I'll, you know, regular things come out of that, like programming the next program year and normal, regular programming. Um, but um, one of the ideas I returned to was could, could confirmation and dismantling racism work together? Um, and, uh, and so this is, so I am in the very early stages of confirmation at Trinity now, and this is the second round of confirmation uh, that I've done there. Um, and really the only um, interaction I've had with confirmation before now were um, very limited. I was at a, a, one parish I was at 
Um, it was literally taught by a man who had been teaching it for 30 years who was a volunteer, and I was just there for moral support. Uh, um, so, you know, I'm still, I, I feel very much um, in the early stages of, of discerning what confirmation can be and look like. And so um, I don't necessarily set this as uh, an exemplar, but as an example of what it looks like contextually. Um, so uh, previously, two years ago, we did Confirm Not Conform, which is, uh, I think, a great uh, program as well. Um, and from that, we had good responses. And what came out of that, what was discerned out of that, was that the young people, much like the research says, actually, and to my surprise, were really interested in the the church stuff, like the, the knowledge checklist kind of stuff, like the history and like the you know the sacraments and the liturgical calendar and all of that. And and they even spoke to wanting. They wish they had had more, which really surprised me. Um, and so um, I didn't. You know, uh, for a number of reasons, it didn't make sense to just shift directly into only racism. Um, and so I figured a way to marry those two things together um, so that really confirm, not conform, provides all of that kind of checklist stuff, but the theolo theology and all of that, and f feeds that need. And even um, our rector and associate rector are kind of the ones who come in and particularly um, uh, provide their expertise in that, uh, not that they're the only ones with it. Um, and then I walk them through um, the entirety of the Dismantling Racism curriculum, which is uh, uh, six lessons, um, and really is just a deep dive into like racism, history, civil rights, like white privilege, like real stuff. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, particularly lead that because I'm, I am a person of color, I am biracial, they are predominantly, like many churches, a Caucasian uh, demographic. Um, and my experience also contextually is that my experience is um, we are in the Bay Area um, and even just taking them to San Francisco, let alone taking them on very urban mission trips like New York City and Washington DC, um, witnessing them encounter the urban realities of the world uh, just uh, really made me aware of how unprepared they were for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it has been, I have discerned that a part of my calling there is to, to help them be aware of what the world is like. Um, and so essentially, uh, again, very early stages, we've had more or less two sessions. And it's been received well, primarily because of the racism component. I've had actually one, uh, the only boy, only person of color, uh, say that was the only reason <laughs> he decided to do confirmation. Um, but um, really the, the contextuality, the adaptiveness of it is both uh, the confirm, not conform part, again, being this tradition, history uh, of our church and our faith, it matters and it's beautiful and it's wonderful. Uh, but to only learn that um, denies the reality and challenge of living in a world that is drastically different than the place that tradition and church came from. Uh, and so uh, I don't want to only equip my young people to be good church people. <laughs> I want to equip them to be people who can really live in the world um, as uh, good humans, but also good people of faith. Um, uh, and so that's, that's where a lot of the design came into that. Mm -hmm. So we'll see if it works. And, <laughs> and it really is just about, um, uh, I, I think what's really important, the key takeaway I would make about design and doing this is it doesn't matter much if it works. Like I'm as much about success as anybody else is. But the uh, the grace and the uh, and the call from God to to try things uh, and to be uh, ambitious in what is possible um, uh, is so so important. So the next key learning is on leadership, and so what was really shown that there needs to be committed people who are champions for confirmation in the, in the parish. 
um, in the worshiping community. So whether that's the rector or a youth minister or uh, a parent, volunteer, someone, at least one person, hopefully more, needs to be a champion and really value discipleship. And that confirmation is just part of that lifelong journey. So those that are leaders in a program understand that this isn't a separate kind of thing, but that it is important that it's part of a lifelong journey. And that, you know, as a champion, they talk about it a lot with others in the congregation and bring others alongside. Um, I think Leadership Part talks about mentors also, and I think Jen's going to talk about mentors a little bit from that. Um, in, in my congregation, there are four of us who are um, sort of leading confirmation, and we each take turns. So in our planning, and we plan... We don't know what, we're making it up as we go along. This is the first time the four of us have done this together. And so we're trying to meet the young people where they are. And so we'll do, we started out with baptism doing that. And then when we did that, we realized, oh my gosh, they really don't understand, you know, they didn't know what the baptismal covenant was. They heard parts of that. So then we, we switched things around and then we started talking about some Bible stories. And then we realized, oh, they don't know the Bible. So we, you know, and, and so we collaborate together in doing that and it's shared leadership. The rector is part of that um, and the children's and youth and families ministers is part of that also. But then there's a parent, not of any of the kids, and then and me, the older person, um, is part of that group too. And it's been really helpful, especially um, when we meet with the young people in that there may be, we've got um, two kids who are on the autism spectrum, total opposite ends, and they're, they're more, um, they have different needs for that. So with so many of us also, one of them has constant, extremely bright, has constant questions but can't hold back on them. So we need, you know, Somebody sits with him and, and un debriefs and goes over all of those really deep questions he has that the rest of them are like, what the heck is he talking about? So, I mean, we're able to kind of gauge and really um, step in and champion for each kid, knowing that each one of them sort of needs an individualized process in some of the ways for that. So leadership is super important. Um, and I think that it can change. It doesn't have to be the same people all of the time. Um, in doing that. Next one is ecology. Um, and I first learned, I never thought of ecology as an educational term at all, but Lisa was the one that sort of shared that with me. I learned it from her, so she's going to explain a little bit about what is an ecology. Oh. So we're just talking about a, a system of, of commitment to formation, right? So Sharon mentioned the lifelong nature of Christian formation that we all hear. What we learned in the Confirmation Project, it makes so much sense intuitively, is confirmation needs to be a piece of a whole that is not only programmatically a piece of a whole, but is connected to the various dimensions of the congregation. So it may be a youth confirmation ministry, but how are the parents and guardians connected to it? How are other adults in the congregation connected to it? How is it connected to the ongoing worship life of the congregation? How is it connected to the outreach and service in the community of the congregation? So confirmation done well is not a class in the basement on Wednesday nights for six weeks that the young people and two adults show up for and you have cold pizza, right? That may be a piece of what you do, but what's really important is that the whole community knows it's happening and recognizes it as a dimension of their mission and their ministry. That means people can be praying for it. Some of the congregations we visited had prayer teams of people who were shut in, who were actively praying for the confirmation ministry. Some of them had um, senior citizens who were mentors to the mentors of the confirmation program. Some of them had recent confirmands who were mentors to younger confirmands. Um, so people who were confirmed last year, who were now in college in some cases, were mentoring kids online through FaceTime or Zoom or WhatsApp. You, you have a sense that when you visit churches, however small they are, who take confirmation seriously with these other models, they're adaptive, they have good leaders, but they're really excited about how confirmation is a period of time that gives everybody a chance to intensify their faith commitment. 
Everybody starts thinking for a while about why they believe what they believe and how they want to reaffirm that with the confirmands at the service of confirmation. So it becomes this catalytic experience for everybody. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And Jen's going to talk about curriculum, which oftentimes is what people think about when they think about confirmation, what curriculum. So. Um, well, I was actually very excited to um, learn that the modern thought or the, the wisdom from the confirmation project is that relationships matter more than any curriculum. Um, because in my context, um, we have several kids in our youth group who are around confirmation age, and none of them re are really excited about being confirmed. They, in contrast to what Patrick said, they, you know, his kids want to learn more about the churchy stuff. My kids care about community. They all serve in the worship service. Many of them participate in healing prayer after Eucharist, but um, they're not, I, I, they're just not interested really in confirmation right now. They even, some of them question whether they believe in God. And, and these are the most, most active kids we have. Um, and alongside of that, we our average Sunday attendance has increased by almost 100% over the last four years. And all of those people are people with very young children and not young adults, but I would say in their th parents in their 30s. And many of these people um, are not even baptized. And come from either a different denomination or unchurched and they're married to someone who um, is a person of faith or has gone to church. And so these people are also curious and it kind of makes, for our, in our context, kind of the perfect marriage of people who, adults who want to know more and youth who want to know more. And um, we've, kind of come to the conclusion that we aren't going to help our youth move forward in confirmation until uh, without these adults who have made, adults with kids, who have made a choice to be there, to be at church, and for these, our youth, to experience what adults have to say about their own faith. And it could be, I'm, I'm excited, we're having a luncheon series uh, um, that is intergenerational, where we're going to have folks who've been at, at our parish for a long time and some of these newer folks and just encourage real conversation around faith and what you believe and kind of demonstrate to especially our youth that faith matters. And these are adults who are going to hopefully open up and share what, why their faith matters to them and why it's important to be a Christian in the world and how what that looks like. So. Um, the relationship part is something that our congregation does really well. It's a really authentic congregation, and so I think this uh, news that <laughs> curriculum doesn't matter as much as the relationships um, is really good news for me. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. We want to have some time for you to ask questions also. So in summary, um, what this, the, the project seemed to say is confirmation is really a unique opportunity for us um, in many ways to help young people strengthen their understanding of the Christian faith, to deepen their experience of what Christian community is. So that's where the leadership and mentors and being in community is all about. And to help them discern their call and where are they in the community beyond the church? How are they living out their baptismal promises? Things like that. So what is the con? You came to hear about the Confirmation Collaborative. We, at this moment, are the Confirmation Collaborative. All of you are included in that. Uh, so a group of us, almost a year ago, um, got together, and it was a really a diverse group in all kinds of ways. Um, we were um, grateful to have Bishop Ted Gulick with us. Um, we had some uh, seminarians, some people who are involved in liturgical studies, in prayer book revision, theologians, and people who have a passion for youth ministry and working with young people in Christian formation together. 
We spent um, several intense days putting newsprint all over the wall like many of you do when you're trying to plan and figure out and dream big. Um, and decided that, of what do we do with all this information about the confirmation project? So many people in our churches never heard of it, did not really understand the implications of it. So how can we, as a body, sort of lift this up and kind of maybe have a movement in the House of Bishops? We've got so many new bishops now. Where can we start... Um, raising this up as this is an opportunity we don't have to do it as like we've always had to do it let's sort of um clear up the myths and and work on our strengths for that so that's what sparked our organization so we are inviting people around the church to join us and that's what's one of your sheets on the table is um and this is initially when we put the invitation out through a press release and things Lots of people emailed myself and Lisa, who were sort of convening the whole thing. Um, and we had like 40 people respond. And what they really wanted was to, they wanted curriculum and they wanted to know what we were going to, to produce. And um, we had some interviews, for example, with the Living Church who wanted to know what curriculum we're producing. We're not producing curriculum because we know that's not what the church needs. The church needs um, to reinvigorate and revision how um, confirmation is part of the life of the church and how do we really look at baptismal renewal for that. I'm going to share, um, this is our statement, which we kind of um, put out. Um, but I, I'd want to, you can read that for yourself. I want to, uh, a sentence that um, Ted Gulick um, quote, you know, said that really resonated with me um, that I think is helpful. He said, we live in a post-Christian era in which we don't see Christians living out their baptismal covenant. In the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, we are to extend the incarnation in the world. It is a matter of life and death. We are in an urgent time. If we practice infant baptism, we need to be clear how that is claimed and lived out throughout adulthood. So how are we in our confirmation, preparation, processes, whatever, helping to make that happen in the world that we live in um, today? So maybe for the time that we have left, um, I mean, our hopes for is to, if you are interested in helping, I love your statement about moving the needle, um, please write your, your questions, what works for you, whatever on this sheet of paper. And if you want to can participate with us on, on a Zoom call to, to collaborate with us in how to figure that out. Um, and it might be just collecting resources of what does exist and putting them on Baptized for Life's website so that we have a place, can, can people can share their stories of best practices and, and things like that um, with that. So what, what are your questions that you have? Any questions? <laughs> Who can move fast? <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm Deb Parker. I moved from a larger church with more confirmation youth to a much smaller church. And I'm trying to invent a new model because this coming fall I'll have two youth who are confirmation aged and I've never dealt with such a small group before, and I'm trying to figure out how can I fold adults into the whole confirmation experience in ways that'll be relevant to 20-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 80-year-olds, whoever opts to participate. Mm -hmm. One of the things I can think of is the use of mentors with all of them. I think that's a really neat opportunity to bring a bunch of ages together and to learn together because I think many of them may have the same questions if there are adults also. Um, and maybe it's time to wait. And that's another thing is maybe it is, maybe you skip a year for confirmation too. 
It, I would also say, um, it, I, yeah, it could be time to wait, but I would, I, um, if it's a question of, I only have two youth, and so I want to invite others into that, um, I would really, uh, there's a particular value to young people just doing that work with young people, I think, so. I would, this is not a question, I would just encourage you if they really desire confirmation, to let mm -hmm. them have that. Mm -hmm. I had a huge confirmation class in previous years. This year I have four boys. And they, they wanted it, they want to be together, and that community that they've formed with each other is awesome. So sometimes the spirit just puts the group together that it puts together, and they might form an awesome partnership in this formation together. And they fit in one car. <laughs> um, the other thing, I, I've been saying this a lot in different places, so it's maybe getting redundant for some of you. There's a lovely new um, liturgical resource in the revised Book of Occasional Services, BOS 18, for the solemn reaffirmation of baptism and confirmation. It's a very neat thing that would be a really natural resource to build a conversation around that's with older teenagers or an intergenerational group. So with this congregation with one or two young people, you might get a few adults who are ready to think seriously about their baptism and have a chance to have that conversation. And you have a link on that handout with the, to get the BOS. This is something I thought of just as you were talking about 20-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 80-year-olds, having mentors for all of them. Would you ever consider having a younger mentor, like a youth mentor for an older person? Very cool. Um, yeah, why not? I mean, that, that would be my initial reaction to that. Well, and I think um, from, if I recall correctly, uh, there was a confirmation uh, conference that happened. And it, at least in Europe, youth to youth, they have that model, right? Like youth mentoring youth. Um, so I think that could definitely work youth to adult even. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the challenges I find with confirmation is it's, it feels like an opportunity to do like all the teaching. Um, and I hear you saying like the curriculum is not the most important thing and we need to be responsive to the needs and the questions in the room. Are there particular content areas that you would say are like particularly critical to make sure that we're covering? Mm -hmm. Engaging with the Bible. Mm -hmm. Not like let's learn Genesis to Revelation. Mm -hmm but allowing people in some form to dwell with scripture so that they're mm -hmm. not afraid of it and they feel like they have a life invitation to read scripture and recognize it when they hear it and listen for God in it. I think the book, Permission Granted, it might be a, above some of the youth, I don't know, but um, it's a great book to, it's Permission Granted to read scripture and interpret scripture on your own mm -hmm. and um, I think that would be a good resource to invite folks to interpret it themselves and realize they don't have to hear it from a rector or any ordained person. I would also add prayer to that and experiential. Um, we're planning on doing sort of an evening with mentors in which we're going to set up a variety of prayer stations. We're going to get a floor labyrinth um, canvas and a variety of other things, but really talk about prayer um, and the various ways that can be done, because I think um, there's just some fear in, in that and needing, as Episcopalians, needing to have something in print that we can write and not know that, and that prayer can go with us uh, kind of thing. I think that that's an important component also. Thank you so much. We have not had a whole lot of time um, for that, but you have my contact information on those sheets. Um, please uh, hand them in. We're going to close with a prayer. And um, so part of being in the Confirmation Collaborative is sharing of resources. So we really want to hear from you. Um, and we will be scheduling another Zoom call probably in um, March at some point. Contact, you've got my email, um, and um, I'm happy to, um, you know, sort of convene that and get in touch with you about all of that and continuing the conversation. So um, share this with others um, back home and things like this. So let's, let's conclude together. Um, 
Let us pray. Almighty God, look with favor upon us as we affirm our commitment to Christ and to serve in his name. Give us courage, patience, and vision, and strengthen us all in our Christian vocation of witness to the world and of service to others through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, you know what? If you just want to bring them up, that would be super.